we know now how to keep our animals comfortable. So the next challenge is how to keep them alive. So then we can work on making them comfortable. So this session is more anesthetic management in animal shelters and really focusing on what we can do better to keep our mortality statistics um, low. And certainly I'm going to go through quite a lot of different things, um, including so, some you know, historical data. But what I'm going to focus on and what I think you'll go away with is specific things that you can go back and focus on that will make a difference in your outcomes and your mortality. So the talking points are really going to be some historical data on anesthetic mortality in dogs and cats, and then some of the most recent data that we have, um, you know, evidence-based medicine. What does it all tell us? What should we be focusing at? Um, is, there, is there data out there that has identified at-risk patients? And the answer is yes, um, there is. So I will help you try and identify the high-risk patients. Um, whether or not certain drugs or techniques that you're using may be implicated in higher or lower mortality. And then, of course, focusing on now we know who's at risk, how we could you know, go ahead and try and make things better. So I, I like to start with this slide. I mean, there is more to good anesthesia than life or death. Um, this is a, a quote from Jamie Gaynor, um, who I've worked with a lot. He used to be at uh, Colorado State University. Um, so, so just not having a dog or a cat die is no longer the criteria for good anesthesia. There's an awful lot um, between living and dying when an animal comes in um, to have a procedure. And I think that's very important um, to keep in mind. Um, but we're going to talk most importantly about the you know, black and white you know, mortality. So again, going back like I did in the first talk, what kind of questions do I get asked a lot? I get asked a lot about, you know, um, for, for all sorts of situations, but specifically um, shelter situations, what are, is it injectable only or injectable inhalant combinations? You know, which one's better, so on. You know, a big question I get is how young or how small is too, or is too young or too small? And I think there has been a lot of emphasis on that we have got to get better at doing very small pediatric patients. Um, but as we go through this talk, you'll see that because of their size, some of those patients are in that high-risk category. And then another question I get asked is, you know, is it okay to mask animals down? And I will address that question and give you the yes or no answer um, this afternoon. So certainly morbidity, you know, things that go wrong, very, very common. Things go wrong, but it's very, very difficult for us in the veterinary community to document mor morbidity issues. So problems with classifying it, you know, what, what is hypertension? Everyone, some people have a different... Um, classification for that. And obviously, if you're not monitoring blood pressure, then you obviously don't have any issues with hypertension, right? <laughs> um, consistency of reporting, and then intraoperative complications, postoperative, you know, are we looking at outcome, you know, do they make it, you know, out of the uh, operating room, or do they make it out of the hospital, or do they make a really good recovery weeks or months later? So mortality is what we're going to focus on. Uh, fortunately, it's a lot less com common to have a, an anesthetic death. It's pretty black and white, single outcome. So that is data that we can very, very easily get from um, good studies. So when we're looking at an outcome, obviously we always want the, the dog and cat to end up this way and not this way. Um, but there's so much involved in a good outcome. We have patient factors. We have hyperthermia. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the impact of hyperthermia on the outcome. Procedural factors personal experience, um, human error. We're going to talk about, you know, what's the commonest human error that results in a death in an animal? What about monitoring, anesthetic management, and, and so on? So lots of factors are involved. So historically, there, the veterinary community has been collecting and documenting mortality data. So from between 1955 and 1969 in the United States, the documented overall mortality for dogs was between 0.23% up to just over 1%. And then it's always been tended that cats have a higher mortality rate. So that was reported to be between 0.35 and up to almost 2% mortality rate. Um, and then more recently, a very large study was done in the United Kingdom between 1984 and 1986. And what they showed was overall mortality um, by about 0.23% higher in cats. Um, but what they showed was there was a difference as we intuitively thought, between mortality in healthy 
and in sick animals. So sick dogs and cats, pretty high mortality. So you'll be interested to see whether or not that's improved in the more recent um, data. And then if you look at the healthy animals, um, that was a mortality in between 84 and 86. So the new data that I'm going to go through, because it really has changed how I practice anesthesia, because now we really should be focusing on evidence-based clinical practice. You know, is there good data out there that says we should change how we do things? There is with anesthesia. It would be nice to show that things have improved, and uh, luckily they have. But it's also, it was time to do a new study, because since that 86 study, there's been new drugs come out in the veterinary market, like metatomidine and dexmedetomidine replacing xylazine. Propofol came on the market, and isoflurane and sevoflurane were beginning to replace um, halothane. And then the other thing that's happened more recently is new monitoring techniques that are being uh, better embraced in different practices. So the study that I'm going to focus on is this excellent study that was conducted in the United Kingdom by David Broadbelt and his group at, um, at the Animal Health Trust and London University. So it was conducted between 2002 and 2004, and there's been many, many, well, it's actually five very good papers have come out of this study. And I'm going to show you and share with you the highlights and why this study has made me change what I do. So sedation or anesthetic-related death in this study was defined as a death in a dog or a cat where the surgical or pre-existing medical causes did not solely cause that animal's death. So they were able to say quite sincerely that it was something about the anesthetic that killed that dog or cat or resulted in that dog or cat's um, death. So the way the study was done, it was a very, very well-designed study. They did a, a pilot study to look at like how many dogs and cats they would need to have a lot of power and so on. So they had um, 117 participating centers, and this ranged from referral centers, university centers, and general practitioners in the United Kingdom. And what they did was they had everybody who was enrolled had to submit their data, whether or not the animals um, died or were alive 48 hours after the procedure. And what they did was they looked at the anesthetic and sedation-related deaths. They took randomly selected um, records from the dogs and cats that survived, and they compared these. What was it about this group that had that the, why they died compared to the animals that went out of the hospital and were still alive 48 hours later. So that is how they um, set up the study. Very, very sophisticated statistics and, and everything. So what they did was, the other thing is you'll be impressed, this is not based on a few dogs and cats. There was 98,000 dogs um, in the study and almost 80,000 cats. Anyone that has to work with rabbits, um, there is some excellent data out of this um, study that is going to be published on mortality and complications in the rabbit. And then while they were at it, they just decided to collect a lot of other um, information on things like ferrets, hamsters, chinchillas, and birds and stuff. And just to reassure you that none of us want to be bird veterinarians, the number one award for mortality was the budget regard. 13% mortality. It was like, so it was bad. So it got the award, and dogs and cats, luckily, a lot less than that. But we're not going to talk about the birds anymore. So overall, what they reported was, in, you know, they had their 98,000 dogs and 80,000 cats. So overall, the risk of death in, in, a, in a dog was 0.17%. So 163 of the dogs out of the 98,000 died. And in the cats, the overall mortality was higher at 0.24%. And then if you try and look around for other data and you know, how well other people are doing, I pulled out this study. Um, this is a study that was done here at the University of Florida looking at our TKX um, protocol. And it's very, very reassuring that we have excellent mortality data considering that we don't know a lot about these cats that are coming in. So overall, mortality was 0.35% in, in the Operation Catnip here. But the actual related to anesthesia, 0.23%, um, which is very similar to the SEPSAF data for you know, what mortality rate runs at in general practice. So that was very reassuring. So when do most deaths occur? And this leads us to where we could focus on making things better. And this is very interesting information. 
So not many animals die after they're pre-med, and very few die at induction. With dogs, about half of the deaths, or less than half of the deaths, occur during anesthesia. In the cats, it's less than 30% of the deaths occur during the procedure. Where the problem arises is postoperatively. That is where most deaths occur. So over, um, you know, over 60% of cats die postoperatively after we're done, and almost 50% of dogs. And then if you look at that data even more carefully, when in the postoperative period are dogs and cats dying? And it's pretty clear in the first three hours. So we have to kind of go, sit back and go, so why are, is that when most deaths occur? And we can come up with lots of reasons. But what it means is that we should be focusing on having better staff recovery areas and then looking at what is it that happens in those first three hours that's causing this high um, instance of mortality. So what about the health status? So intuitively, we would, we would kind of assume that sicker animals um, have a higher mortality. So in this study, everybody that um, filled in the paperwork was asked to assign a health status to the dog or a cat. And they used the American Society of Anesthesiologists um, uh, assessment. Um, so a healthy animal is ASA 1 or 2, a sick animal is ASA 3 to 5. So what they found was that healthy animals had a lower mortality and the sicker animals had a higher mortality, but a lot less than 3.3%, which was the um, sick mortality data from back in the um, mid-80s. So things had improved there. Um, so overall, we've got cats and dogs, and then in the healthy, you have healthy dogs and healthy cats, and that is the mortality. So less of a chance of dying if you're healthy when you go under anesthesia than if you're sick. So intuitively, that confirms what we probably thought. But again, you know, we, when we have, certainly in shelters, we have elective procedures. An elective procedure is not always on a completely healthy animal. They may come in for an ovary hysterectomy. They could be normal and healthy. They might be pregnant. And that's going to cause changes. They may be an estrus, or it may be, you open them up and it's a pyometra. So you may have allotted them to an ASA 1 or 2 status, and actually you assigned them to the wrong status, and there may be more chance that something goes wrong. And then these, the group of experts that looked at the causes of death and analyzed the, the reports that came in tried to you know, figure out why they were dying. And it was pretty clear that with a lot of the dogs, it was cardiac arrest. 23% um, of dogs, it was fairly clear that's what happened. Um, respiratory complications in 13%. Um, but in, in cats, it was much, much harder to figure out like, why they had died and so most of them, it was put down to either a cardiac or a respiratory event that caused their death. There was a few animals that just didn't, don't, didn't wake up, didn't recover from anesthesia. Some that were euthanized um, post-op for renal, acute renal failure. And then a significant number where they never could figure out like, why the animal had actually died. So what about risk factors? Well, one of the things that came up was extremes of age um, does dictate a, a, one of the risk factors um, for our patients. So dogs, their age, regardless of their health status. So even if you have an elderly dog, but it is healthy, is assigned an ASA 1 or 2, the fact that it is older is going to increase the risk. And this is very good data. Um, it makes us know that older animals or older dogs are at risk. So dogs over the age of 12 are 9.8 times more likely to die under anesthesia than a dog between six months and five years of age. Now, all of you are probably thinking, well, in dogs, you know, a 12-year-old dog, um, you know, a chihuahua who's age six is not very old, but a St. Bernard who's age six is quite an old dog. So it's a little bit harder to interpret some of this data. But regardless of their health status, age, unfortunately, does make them um, a higher risk um, animal. When it comes to cats, again, regardless of their health status, age is a factor. So older cats are at higher risk, not as high as the older dogs were, but certainly cats over the age of 12, three and a half times more likely to die than cats aged between one and five years of age. So what is it about senior dogs and cats or older dogs and cats? Well, certainly as we age and as animals age, there's a decrease in reserve capacity in both the lungs and cardiovascular system. So they just can't withstand the same insults that the young robust animals can. The other thing is probably a decrease in metabolism. So we may be actually giving relative anesthetic overdoses to them. 
And as we age, some of us know this, our, um, our, our gray matter decreases, so we don't need as much anesthetic. Um, and we're not altering our protocols um, to, to account for that. The other thing is there's no doubt that older animals have a much harder time um, thermoregulating. And as we talk, um, hypothermia, I think, is a, a common um, contributor to anesthetic death. And then, of course, older animals more likely to have subclinical disease that we just didn't pick up on. But what I think is very interesting here is what's different about dogs and cats? Well, we all know cats have to be different, and unfortunately, they want to be different as far as how difficult they are to anesthetize. So when you look at this overall, cats are twice as likely to die compared to a dog, and when they're healthy or, or put in a healthy category, again, twice as likely to die. When they're assigned to the sick status, it's about the same. So we do equally well, if you think 1.3% mortality is good, um, for sick dogs and cats. But there's something different about healthy cats and overall mortality. So what is it that makes cats more likely to die? Well, it could be size. It could be they're much more difficult to work with. And I have some theories. So are cats truly at a greater risk of dying? Or are we misclassifying them? Are they actually sicker than we think? Is it because we probably know that our preoperative assessment in cats is sometimes less thorough than in dogs because they're very difficult sometimes to, to deal with? Or is it that cats have a lot more subclinical disease than we really um, you know, think about? So what they um, found, or what, we, what I'm beginning to think is, the more and more we work with cats and learn about cat cardiac disease, I think this is probably one of the reasons that we lose cats under anesthesia. So these are just three papers that I pulled out that make me wonder every day when I nest as a cat. You know, they looked at assessment of the prevalence of heart murmurs in healthy cats, aged between one year and six years of age. Prevalence of cardiomyopathy in apparently healthy cats. Again, some of them were quite young. And then this paper that came out looking at um, echocardiography in cats that you can detect a murmur. And so basically, it turns out that you can have a completely apparently healthy cat that doesn't have a murmur, but 15% of the time, it's going to have cardiomyopathy. How are we going to know that? And so I think what we're, what's happening is that we are anesthetizing what we think are healthy cats, but actually they have severe underlying cardiac disease. And unless we echo every cat, and we're not going to be able to do that, we might not know that we're dealing with one of these cats. Now, the other thing, putting that, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, out of the SEPSAF study, IV fluid therapy was a risk factor. Giving fluids to cats increased the risk of anesthetic death. And that was both in healthy and in sick cats. So is that that we were inaccurately delivering fluids to these cats? We weren't actually weighing them, we were accidentally overloading them, or we were giving fluids to animals with subclinical heart disease. So I think that a lot of the pieces of the puzzle start to make sense. So certainly when we are doing um, fluid therapy, one of the things I find very difficult in the clinic is with these types of drip sets, knowing whether you're bolusing, because sometimes when it's full on, they look like they're not, your, the fluids aren't on, and then you have to go up and get out your bifocals and look, <laughs> and then, oh, gosh, it's full on, and oh my goodness, the cat's had you know, a lot of fluid. So that has led to some accidental overdoses in our clinic. So we now have some um, policies in place for that, for cats. So when we do a cat, we, we, if we're going to give fluids at all, we use a Buretrol, and we don't just fill it up. We don't fill it up to the 100. We only now put in one hour's worth of fluids. Or we use a fluid pump, which is a bit of a luxury, and we set it. The other thing that I have done is I've completely cut back on my fluid therapy rate. Um, to cats under anesthesia, I'm not going over five mils per kilo per hour, or sometimes even less. So I think maybe this combination of subclinical heart disease and too many fluids is what's been causing a problem. So it'd be nice to go back and look at the data now that we've adjusted or kind of taken that into account. In dogs, extremes of weight um, contribute to mortality. So if a dog weighs less than five kilos, it is 7.6 times more likely to die than a dog between 5 and 15 kilos. Um, so there's something about being small that puts you at risk. Um, and the other thing that we found from this uh, sepsis study, when, when they actually asked the veterinarians, 
So you weighed the dogs and you wrote down a weight. They, what they actually said was, well, we guessed the weights a lot of the time. And so estimated weight is probably not a thing that we should be doing. We should be doing accurate weighing. But there's something about being a small dog that makes you um, a higher risk candidate for anesthesia. Now cats, the same. What they found in cats was it's, um, you know, and we're pushing to do um, pediatric spays and neuters, and I think it's excellent, and we should get really good at that. But in this study, if you weigh, if you're a cat and you weigh less than two kilos, you are at much higher risk than uh, of anesthetic death compared to a, a cat that weighs between two and six kilos. The opposite, the other end of the spectrum is true too. If you have an obese cat, um, that increases the risk of anesthesia as well. So being less than two kilos or obese is not good if you're a cat. Um, so we do need to kind of think, like, why that contributes to mortality. So I think with small dogs and cats, what I think might be going on is that we're doing relative drug overdoses because we're not accurately weighing them. Because, um, again, like in that SEPSAF study, 20% of the time people just guess the weight. And then I think the other thing about being small is you're going to be at much higher risk for hypothermia. So certainly we should be accurately weighing our very small patients and we should be using appropriate dilutions of our drugs and diluting down accurately and using um, you know, insulin syringes and doing our dosaging um, very, very accurately in these animals. And then, as I'll talk later, focusing on probably on keeping them warm. The reason that obese animals are at higher risk is that for every gram or so many grams of fat that is in your body, there's an increased cardiac workload. So it puts the heart under a lot more stress and the heart is already challenged by anesthesia. Fat animals don't breathe as well under anesthesia. Everybody knows that. You put a fat animal on its back, they don't breathe very well. Big issue. Um, altered pharmacokinetics, you know, you're, you're dosing them on based on their body weight. Maybe we should be dosing them on lean body weight. And then the other thing is, there's no doubt, everyone's done these, right? The, the, the fat dog spay, not, an easy, not as easy a procedure, a lot more complications. There is some breed susceptibility, and intuitively we probably could have guessed this, but brachycephalic breeds, yes, they're at higher risk, and they're at higher risk because of respiratory obstruction and so on. So we do need to actually take specific care of brachycephalic breeds and their airway when we anesthetize them. The type of procedure um, definitely is important. They used neutering as their reference and then compared other procedures to that. So mostly we are predominantly this group, we're talking about stays and neuters, but we in shelters do a lot of other procedures, you know, amputations, recreations, and so on. Um, dental surgery, um, it, it's a, that surprised me, but that's a much higher risk factor, diagnostic, and then minor versus major. So it kind of confirms what we intuitively thought. The duration of the procedure is also very important. Like I emphasize, small incisions do make a difference, and so does timing and how good you are and how fast you can get your procedure done. So once procedures went over two hours in dogs, the odds ratio of dying went up almost fourfold compared to something that can be completed within an hour. And then when it comes to cats, once you go over 90 minutes, the odds ratio of dying goes up again just over threefold compared to short 30-minute procedures. So it is important to train your veterinarians to be you know, speedy. But the other thing is, it's not just duration of the surgery, is if once you anesthetize an animal, something should be happening to that animal all the time. If I'm sitting there with an anesthetized animal and I'm waiting for a surgeon, that's not good planning because we're extending our anesthesia time. So we need to plan well. So, you know, I have a tech that tells me if something's not happening, something's wrong. Something should be happening to this animal, not sitting there waiting for someone to do something to it. So we need to plan carefully to keep our anesthetic time down. Preoperative blood work, um, you know, I, I work at a university and the students want to run blood work for everything, including needing to know what the dog's cholesterol is. And I'm like, what's your physical exam tell you? Well, I've got to look at the blood work first. I'm like, no. Good physical exam will tell you a lot. And I'm glad to say that the SEPSAF study showed that, that pre -op, running preoperative blood work only decreased the odds in an already sick animal. So despite the fact it is really nice to do PCD total solids, you know, we have a lot of anemic animals coming into the shelter and so on, it's probably not going to alter the outcome of your clinically-based 
choice of anesthetic protocol. Endotracheal intubation, that came out as something that's really important to discuss because what they found in this study was that if you intubate a cat for a short procedure, it increases the risk of them having uh, anesthetic mortality. If it's a long procedure and in a sicker cat, then intubating them is beneficial, actually decreases the risk of them dying. Now, maybe it's because they also were able to show that respiratory obstruction in recovery happened more commonly in cats and was a cause of acute death in cats. So for short procedures, intubating a cat puts them at higher risk. So we've always been, you know, everyone got to get a tube in, protect the airway and all that stuff. Here's good evidence-based medicine that says that doesn't decrease the risk. It actually increases the risk. Less than 30 minutes, you know, sort of the 30-minute procedure. So most of your cat procedures, hopefully. Um, so why, why, you know, is this an issue? So with cats, we know intubation is much um, harder. They're prone to laryngospasm. If you don't intubate very carefully, you cause trauma. It's a small airway, very likely to swell. You know, you cause bleeding, tracheal irritation. And then we all know if you get overzealous and inflate the cuff, tracheal rupture in cats is um, not, you know, uncommon. We had one in here just last week, um, tracheal rupture after, um, a week after it had a procedure done. So if you are going to intubate cats, and for longer procedures and for sick cats, it's important. But I would say, even if you think you're really good at it, I always do say try and put local anesthetic on the cords to inhibit laryngospasm. Don't try and intubate a cat that's only half anesthetized. That's very, very traumatic, cause a lot of swelling. And when you do go to inflate the cuff, be extremely careful. Only inflate so you don't have a leak when you squeeze the bag and you expand the, um, the lungs. So be very careful about these steps. But what we could actually say is we need to kind of rethink that. And certainly um, for short procedures, I'm really trying to get people to think you know, better about it. We do a lot of repeat anesthesias for animals, uh, cats going through radiation therapy. And it's been a big mindset change to have our technicians not intubate a cat for a five-minute radiation therapy procedure. And they're like telling me, my God, these cats aren't coughing, and they're not gagged. It's great, you know, um, as long as you're there and watching. So I think perhaps if the procedure is for less than 30 minutes and it's a healthy cat, maybe we shouldn't be intubating them. But yes, if it's long, it's a sick cat, if it's an obese cat, or if it's a brachycephalic cat, then yes, that would be a sensible choice. What about anesthetic drugs? Are there anesthetic drugs that can be implicated in causing problems or actually increasing mortality? Well, again, that was why this study has been so helpful to me. What they were able to show without a doubt was that pre-medication reduces mortality. So the taking, grabbing your dog, and either masking it down with no pre-meds or placing an IV and inducing it with an induction agent is not the best thing to do. So pre-medication reduces mortality. I get a lot of pushback from people that say, well, the dog is too old or too young or cat or too sick to have a pre-med. And I'm like, hmm. The drugs that kill animals are the induction drugs and the inhalants. Those are the most cardiovascular depressant drugs that we deal with in anesthesia. So if you give lots of nice pre-meds that are anesthetic sparing so you can decrease induction and maintenance drugs, it's going to make a big difference in your mortality rate. So acepromazine reduced the risk factor by up to five-fold in one of the large clinics that they looked at, specifically data in that one clinic. Acepromazine, it's pretty inexpensive. It's not a controlled substance. What does it do? Why is it so good? And this is true even in horses. If you give a horse acepromazine before you anesthetize it, it is less likely to die. So it decreases the dose of induction drugs, and it can decrease the need for inhalants by up to 40%. And that's the drug, those are the drugs that get us into trouble. The other things about um, acepromazine is antiarrhythmic, it's antiemetic, but it's also calming. So you don't have these rough, crazy recoveries. So lots of good things to say about acepromazine. The alpha-2s, it was very good because they were able to go back and look at the data where the only alpha-2 we had was xylazine. And they looked at the previous UK data, which was this Clark and Hall data. And then they looked at 
this is data from the United States, this is data from Canada, and this is data from the United States. There is absolutely clear cut evidence out there that the use of xylazine increases the risk of mortality. So xylazine as an alpha-2 um, does, and actually in the Canadian study, it was actually a huge um, factor in causing cardiac arrest. And what, why does that happen? Because xylazine sensitizes the heart to catecholamines. And so if the dog gets excited in recovery or is painful or is being masked down and gets excited, you're going to be in, in trouble. The good news is the latest data on metatomidine and now dexmedetomidine does not show any increased risk. So these are drugs that can be used very effectively. They showed that it decreased risk of death similarly to acepromazine. And the reason to, for that is quite scientific. We do know from research studies that these two drugs do not sensitize the heart to catecholamines. And I also think that now people are much better educated on the use of alpha-2s. Um, the drug companies have done a very good job of explaining to people what does an alpha-2 do? It makes the heart rate really slow. It does this, it does that. And I think we're much better at using alpha-2s. So xylazine, I can support the use of xylazine, um, but uh, metatomidine and dexmedetomidine, yes. The induction technique does matter. And certainly, you know, again, the dog is too old, too sick to have anything except be masked down. No, that is not true. If you mask down an animal, it's more likely, certainly the dog data, it didn't actually come out as being significant in the cats, but in dogs, it increases the risk of death sixfold. So masking down is not a good idea. Like, and what they, what they specifically mean is that grab the animal and just mask it down. Now, I will mask down cats and dogs occasionally, but they've usually been sedated and not with something like xylazine, but they have been sedated. They're usually fairly calm. And sometimes I do mask them down because we can't get an IV in or we can't whatever. But the straight take care of dog or cat and mask it down is something that we cannot um, really support based on good um, evidence-based medicine. So the mask induction, there's no doubt it's stressful. Um, you're going to get catecholamine release. You have an unprotected airway. Um, so certainly in those brachycephalics, it's not a good idea. But the main reason is if you're masking down an animal, you're giving them a massive dose of anesthetic, of inhalant agent. Um, and you're going to have a lot more cardiovascular and respiratory depression from that technique. When it came to inhalant agents, they were able to show, compared to the previous study, that halothane, which we you know, almost don't use at all now, halothane did increase the risk of death. So now we're not using it. Mortality should be better. But there wasn't enough data. Um, there weren't enough people using sevoflurane. So we don't actually know at the moment if there's any difference between isoflurane and sevoflurane. Intuitively, um, and from based on some much smaller studies, we would probably say that there's unlikely to be a difference between those two agents because neither of them sensitize the heart to catecholamines the way that halothane used to. Does it matter who monitors the patient? And the answer to that is, yes, it does. If you have a dedicated person, whether it be a technician, a volunteer, a student, or, an, or a qualified anesthesiologist, if you have someone paying attention to just the anesthesia, then it does decrease mortality. And I think that... Um, you know, the phrase, there are no safe anesthetics, no safe anesthetic procedures, just a safe anesthetist is very true. But I also understand that's not always possible in a large volume um, spay and neuter um, you know, situation. So we'll talk about how we might get around that. Human error does contribute to anesthetic death. Anybody, I've probably given away by these pictures. What do you think the commonest human error is? The pop-off valve. And that came out in this study. They had the commonest human error that results in an animal dying is getting the bag blowing up, the pressure going way up. Someone turned the pop-off valve closed and then forgot to open it. So I would definitely suggest that you invest in, we have these safety valves on all of ours because, you know, I'm trying to keep track of lots of students that are new to anesthesia. So we almost never use this except at the start we're testing out our circuit. When we want to give the animal a breath, we just push down with that, squeeze, let go, there's no way of turning off the, or turning close the pop-off valve, but it's a common cause of um, death. You've probably all seen that, where you run across the room and disconnect and, and hope that they made it. Yeah. What we were able to find out from this study is that monitoring the pulse or, the, or using pulse oximetry decreases mortality 
certainly in cats, they had very good data. So if you are doing something about you know, monitoring the pulse or using a pulse oximeter in a cat, you decrease the odds down to 0.2%, a huge decrease in mortality, probably because it alerted you to something was about to happen or something was going wrong. So if you're monitoring the pulse and using pulse oximeters, it's going to alert you to problems. And certainly it is, it is a, a good idea. We'll talk about what I think is practical monitoring. Quality of recovery, um, they showed that poor quality of recovery increased mortality. So is that due to pain? Probably. If you have an animal that's you know, having a violent recovery and painful, we're going to have cataclysmic, all sorts of um, reasons. So focusing on a nice, quiet, comfortable recovery is going to decrease your mortality. And we've seen this dog. So that kind of recovery actually can result in death and, and a lot of problems. So we need to focus on not having that happen. And hopefully we went through a lot of that in the last session. So temperature, it was only in that study, you know, the 80,000 cats and 90-some, 8,000 dogs, temperature was only routinely monitored. Now, obviously everyone had a TPR before they went in for their procedure, but it was routinely monitored in less than 3% of cases, and I think that temperature and maintaining normal body temperature is something that we really could improve on and we should be focusing on. So, as a, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Number one on my top 10 list of anesthetic problems that we can do something about is hypothermia. If I had my, if he was doing our top, my top 10 list, I, I don't know what would be 10, 9, 8, 7, but number one for sure would be hypothermia. So are we doing better than we were before? Well, the answer is yes, we are. Um, certainly, we've had a decrease in overall mortality. It's, it's pretty nice decrease in dogs. Um, healthy dog mortality has decreased a lot, as has um, sick dogs. We're better at dealing with sick animals. And then for the cat, improvements are still there, maybe not as good as in, in the dog. And we still have this issue of healthy um, cats being more likely to die and healthy dogs, but maybe we're beginning to understand why that is from what I've been saying. So summary of the risk factors in both dogs and cats, health status, um, obviously, weight, extremes of weight, age, older animals are at higher risk, duration of the procedure, and then the specific things in the cat, intubation and IV fluids, and in the dog, the mask induction was found to be a risk, caused increased um, risk of dying. Other things to focus on, most deaths occur in the first three hours after anesthesia. So if you're going to change how your clinic runs, you should probably be dedicating people to look and monitor and be watching the animals during that critical time. So we, we now have you know, actual recovery units that are fully staffed um, during that critical time. And it's obviously, if that's when the problems arise, we should be focusing on trying to you know, look at that first three hours. So we should, and it kind of makes sense, you know, you're doing a procedure, the animal's on 100% oxygen, it's on the table, it's being kept warm. You take it to the recovery room, you pull everything off and walk away. And so you're pulling out off a lot of support at a very critical time. Uh, we know that cats get airway obstructions. Um, and if you remember that data, you know, at some point, you know, 20% of animals, we didn't know why they died. And if you go back and look at that data, basically they went back to the recovery room and found the dog and the cat dead. And certainly that's something we should um, avoid. So certainly things have improved, but I really think that we can still do better. So what could we practically focus on to make things um, better, have fewer um, deaths? So things to focus on, identifying the at-risk animals. And we've already done that. If you're old or you're very small, you need some extra attention. We should be pre-medicating our animals. We should be providing good perioperative analgesia to have good recoveries. Rethink intubation of cats and judicious fluid therapy. Those we've covered. So the things I want to focus on now are improved monitoring and you know, how important it is to keep these animals warm, how to avoid or prevent hypothermia. So monitoring is something that we ought to do. You know, definitely prevention is always better than treatment. And we know that having a person dedicated to anesthesia does decrease the risk of death. That's not always um, possible. So what kind of monitors 
should we use in a busy situation? So what they showed in, in, in these different practices in the United Kingdom, what were people using? Well, about 50% of people had a pulse oximeter, but having a pulse oximeter and using a pulse oximeter is not the same. Um, you know, and things like if you want AHA accredited, you have to own one. It doesn't say you have to use it. Um, that's a little loophole there. About 12% of people were using capnograph, very few people using EKGs, and not many people actually routinely monitoring blood pressure. But it's pretty clear from the human data that if you use pulse oximetry and capnography, it's going to detect 93% of critical incidents related to anesthesia. We are probably not going to be moving into this arena very quickly, but pulse oximetry is something people are you know, using a lot, and the technology is getting better and is less expensive. So if you have a critical incident, and certainly there's been a lot of studies, like what do people respond to? And we can buy anesthetic monitors that are visual or audible. And it's pretty clear that people respond to an audible alarm or a change in what they're hearing versus what they might not be seeing. Because we are not in a busy clinic staring at the monitor. We should be looking at the animal or we're doing something else. We're teching the case or something. So you should be focusing on getting monitors that have audible um, alarms. So, yes. Pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. Oops. So people like really respond, and if you're the the surgeon who's also you know doing your surgery, but want to know what's going on, the audible um, alarms. The other thing is, um, the reason that the manufacturers put in what are called doctor-proof alarms and buttons, and this for a reason. So you should not be turning off or silencing the alarms. So this is, and I understand, this is luxury, and this is what we're dealing with a lot of the time. We have you know, people kind of rotating, but again, if you have something audible and someone that's you know, at least scanning the room, we can probably do a much better job picking up um, problems um, quickly. So pulse and heart rate, you know, things that we should be looking at, you know, is the heart rate really high? And then again, you know, how high is too high and what, what's the definition of bradycardia? Um, so certainly tachycardia, if you routinely use anticholinergics, atropine or glycoparta in your protocols, you're going to see a lot of tachycardia and it's not a good thing. I do not use atropine or glycoparta routinely. Um, I only use those two drugs if I need to treat a slow heart rate. Um, it could be a fast heart rate due to pain or the animal's too light for what you're doing. And then bradycardia, again, you know, a lot of the students tell me that they've been told that a heart rate of less than 60 is bradycardic. And I'm like, well, what if it's a really fit um, greyhound? I mean, it never has a heart rate of 60. And if it's a chihuahua, then 60 is pretty low. So it's in comparison to what their normal heart rate is. But certainly you'll see bradycardia, vagal tone, um, potent opioids. But one of the commonest causes of slow heart rates is hypothermia. And if you think about it, cardiac output, we always want that to be good. And it's a combination of heart rate and stroke volume. So changes in heart rate are going to have a big impact on cardiac output. Obviously, if one or the other is zero, then output is zero. And then blood pressure, you know, we do, you know, so for very short procedures and healthy animals, you know, maybe we don't need to do this. A lot of people tell me, you know, I can feel the pulse and tell you if it's okay. Now, I've been doing anesthesia for a long time, and I cannot put my finger on animals. I can tell you it's got a pulse. But people, you know, have to think what you're feeling when you feel the pulse is the pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic. So in this, and if you actually work out how the mean pressure is calculated, and it's the mean pressure that dictates perfusion. So this animal is going to feel like it's got a fantastic pulse, but its mean pressure is only 60. This animal, pulse pressure is much lower, but by the time you do all this math, this animal has a much better mean arterial blood pressure. So touching the pulse tells you it's got a pulse or not. It doesn't tell you necessarily how good it is. So blood pressure, what's okay? Well, what we would like are mean arterial pressures of over 60 or systolic pressure over 90. Those are kind of guidelines because that's what we know will cause good organ perfusion. And why worry? Well, our, high, our older animals are higher risk anesthetic candidates, right? 
and what could go wrong. All sorts of things could go wrong. But certainly, I think one of our main concerns in the older animals is if they have low blood pressure, we're going to have renal hypoperfusion. And a lot of these animals do have limited renal um, reserves. And we need to be um, careful that we're not causing any more um, insult to their um, kidneys. So hypertension, how common is hypertension? And again, a lot of people will tell you, we don't have any problems with hypertension. We feel the pulse, there's never a problem. But again, if you're not me measuring it, um, so the group, the, the group at Colorado, what they did, they went out into local practices and just took, out, took a Doppler and went out there, looked at elective procedures in healthy animals, cats and dogs, and looked at how common it is to have a hypertensive um, event. And in cats, between 10 and 33% of the time, and in dogs, you know, 8 to 32% of the time. So hypotension is common in our patients. So we can do indirect blood pressure monitoring, and that's routinely what we're going to do. Um, if you have a person that can manually do the Doppler, it's a very nice technique because you have the audible pulse signal all the time and then intermittent monitoring. You can have automated um, you know, machines, which are all well and good. You know, they're usually set to go off at a specific time and so on, a lot more expensive than a Doppler. The thing that is very important if you are going to invest in blood pressure monitoring is that you do it right, because if you don't do it right, you get lots of, um, you know, inaccurate readings. The most important thing is choosing the right size of cuff. And so the cuff, when you lay it this way, um, endwise, should go 40% of the uh, circumference of the limb that you're going to wrap it around. So you should, it should go from here to there. And then when you put it on, this is a cat, obviously, put it on, that's going to give you an accurate reading. If it's too small, it overreads. And if it's too big, it underreads. So this is an important thing. So you do need a range of cuffs um, to work with. And then my preferred technique really is I really do like the Doppler because we can put it on, we can listen to it, and then we, with a signal monitor, we can get some intermittent um, monitoring. Now, if we're doing a five-minute castration, I'm not going to do this. If we're doing a 30-minute, you know, 45-minute procedure, I'll do it. Or if I have an older cat that I'm worried about, I'm going to do it as well. The other thing is you have to think about what are we measuring and what's it telling us. So if we remember back to our good basic physiology, cardiac output is going to be altered by heart rate or stroke volume. That's pretty obvious. But what we're, at, we're not measuring cardiac output. We're measuring blood pressure. And blood pressure is, you know, is, you know, dependent on cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. And so, you know, you can measure blood pressure and say, oh, everything must be good, but not necessarily so. So when, what situation would we have a very high systemic vascular resistance? That would be when we use a lot of alpha-2s in our animals. We get vasoconstriction. So a lot of the time, the animals will have a very good blood pressure because we've just manipulated this, right? This may not actually be very good, so you can be misled sometimes that you have good blood pressure, but perfusion might not be um, ideal. So it just gives you a good idea, um, but you have to be thinking, like, why is the blood pressure really good? Is it because of drugs, or is it because it really is good? Um, and just think about what you're measuring. So risk factors, um, this data we've already shared. So pulse monitoring and pulse oximetry makes anesthesia safer without a doubt, decreased it by um, down to 0.2, so almost a five-fold decrease in mortality if you are just doing something about monitoring the pulse. So pulse oximeters, they're, they're becoming less and less expensive. They give you an audible sound. They're measuring hemoglobin saturation. You can, you can listen and know what, how fast the pulse is. And just by how they change the loudness, you get a qualitative indication of the pulse strength. When they get very quiet, we sometimes pay attention. Um, so it, it, they, do, um, they, they do serve a very good role. Are they always reliable? The answer to that is no. So there are some patient problems. Um, abnormal hemoglobins, that's not very common. Patient movement, that is a big issue, um, especially if you're trying to do a pulse ox on an on animal that's waking up and shivering. And then one of the biggest things that we don't think about are extrinsic problems. And one of them is the ambient light and that interfering with the um, little red... Um, light. So lighting, the lighting that comes from surgical lights and from fluorescent lights can interfere with the pulse oximeter um, reading very, very markedly. So my advice is that you should cover the probe 
um, especially if you're working under OR lights or under fluorescent lighting, either cover it over. The other thing I sometimes do is wrap the tongue in a wet gauze and then keep my pulse oximeter and then cover this. But if you actually hold your pulse oximeter up to a surgery light, you can sometimes get it to give you a reading because it's interfered with the little infrared um, beam. So cover it up. Evaluation of pulse oximeters. This is a fairly old paper, but has been very useful for me um, in how I use my pulse oximeters. So this, they took five commercially available pulse oximeters and evaluated them in the dog, the cat, and the horse that we're not talking about. They looked at different sites. They looked at the tongue, the paw, the ear, the lip, and the prepuce or vulva. You know, places that we all have like, oh, can I get it to work here? Can I get it to work there? You know that. And then what they did was they, these were um, experimental animals. They had a wide range of saturation, well oxygenated and not well oxygenated. And they looked at accuracy and how many failed readings. And the, the main thing that came out of this study is how to position or where to put the pulse oximeter. I'm guessing that nearly everybody here sticks it on the tongue. That's what people tend to do. So is that the right thing to do or not? Well, depends if you're a dog or a cat. So we look at the dog data, and I've actually, you know, find this to be true. So in the dog, the toe, actually, between the toes or in the web, was better than the tongue. But the toe or the tongue are quite good in the dog. Um, the prepuce and vulva are good. And then the worst place in the dog was the lip. And then the very worst place was sticking it on the ear. Not accurate at all. Now, when it came to the cat, what they actually found was that the paw was better than the ear, better than the front paw better than the tongue, better than the lip. So actually, the paw, the rear paw on the cat, is the best place to place your pulse oximeter probe. And that's what we try and do as much as possible. And as you'll see, the tongue, actually, in the cat, is not a great place to put it, but it's OK in the dog. So that might, if you go back and kind of fiddle with your pulse oximeter, you might get some better luck. So what they don't tell you, certainly, if you have an animal that's intubated and breathing 100% oxygen, your pulse oximeter will be beeping away and telling you that they're great, they're 98% saturated, everything's good. Don't forget, they're not telling you if they're hypoventilating. You can have an animal, and this is a real blood gas from an animal with a pulse oximeter reading of 98%. You all know this is not good, good. So the animal was severely hypoventilating, you know, got a very high CO2. So if they're breathing oxygen, your pulse oximeter isn't going to tell you that. Breathing room air and hypoventilating it's going to alarm and they're going to get deceptive. So it doesn't tell you everything, but they are still worth using. So then I'm going to focus a little bit on hypothermia, the big chill. And I think it's something that you can really go away and focus on. and It'll make a big difference in mortality and how well your animals come out of procedures. So perioperative hypothermia, why does it happen? What's bad about it? And what can we do about it? That's kind of it in a nutshell. So normal body temperature is absolutely essential for enzyme, enzymatic function, nerve conduction, muscle contraction, blood flow, and clotting of blood. So all very basic normal body functions are all totally, in mammals, temperature dependent. And if we look at the circuit for thermoregulation, most mammals, when they're conscious, regulate their body temperature in a very, very narrow range. It doesn't fluctuate. Um, much between plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius. And that's because we have um, thermal receptors, um, an integrated central nervous system. We have the environment, heat loss, heat production, and metabolism. This is a very, very tightly controlled circuit in mammals. And if you think about anesthesia and surgery, what we do, we disrupt this everywhere. We give drugs that alter the central nervous system function. We decrease their metabolism. We certainly stress them in cold operating rooms. So we do a lot to disrupt this whole tight mechanism. So certainly animals are going to lose heat through radiation. They're all warmer than the ambient temperature, um, well, in most places. Uh, so the, the animals are going to radiate heat to the colder um, ambient temperature. Then, you know, how often do you see an animal sitting on a cold surface? Quite often, they're going to um, conduct heat straight into this cold metal table. It always seems to me that I'm standing right below one of those air vents, and so we get wind chill by putting ourselves underneath an air vent, so we have convection losses. And then we challenge our animals with evaporative heat loss from using cold prep solutions that suck heat out of them. And then obviously, if you have um, exposed viscera, 
obviously the, the, the moisture is evaporating and taking heat with it. So we expose them to a lot of challenges under anesthesia and surgery. So a long, long time ago, people were really, you know, knew that animals got cold under anesthesia. This is data from back in the 70s. So we've known about this for a long time, but it's not until more recently we've had good techniques to prevent this. So, and it's definitely a, a, a problem with the smaller animals. If you do nothing for 60 to 120 minute procedures in dogs that weigh less than 10 kilos, they can really lose body heat. I mean, we don't hopefully see this very often, but it, it happens if you do nothing about it. If they're bigger animals, the heat loss is obviously a lot less. And again, what did we say? Small animals are at risk of dying, and a lot of it is probably to do with hypothermia, I think. So anesthesia and thermoregulation, when we anesthetize an animal, we completely withdraw all of their opportunities to behaviorally respond to a heat challenge. They can't shiver, they can't go get warm, because we're laying them there in a cold operating room, all exposed. When we give anesthetics, we reduce their metabolic rate, so they're not generating metabolic heat. And then we give them drugs that alter their um, CNS, so their hypothalamus isn't um, working normally either. They can't shiver under anesthesia, and vasoconstriction is a very, very late response to hypothermia under anesthesia. And then the anesthetic agents that we use, especially the inhalants, isofluorine and sevofluorine, cause vasodilation and then um, enhanced heat loss. So intraoperative hypothermia, the redistribution is very, very sudden, right in the first 15 to 30 minutes after we induce anesthesia. And then the rate of heat loss kind of, you know, is less. And then eventually after, you know, we're not in doing routine procedures out here, eventually it's sort of like they, they begin to vasoconstrict and respond and we get, you know, decrease. So it's critical, even in, you say, well, I'm doing a really short procedure, but in a short 30 minute procedure, boom, they can drop their temperature very, very quickly. So heat loss begins immediately after pre-medication because the pre-med drugs alter hypothalamic function and things like ACE, which are, I still think are good to use, cause some vasodilation. But the greatest rate of heat loss is the first 20 minutes after induction. Usually they're out in the prep room. You may not be doing a lot to keep them warm. You're using cold alcohol and blah, blah, blah. So that is, even if it's a short procedure, that's when they lose a lot of heat. The complications of getting cold are greatly underestimated. There is almost nothing good about being cold. So one of the big things, and we have data to support that, is how long it takes them to recover. So here's data that was published um, from an Australian um, group. And what they showed was, if you're in this temperature range, obviously they, they're using Celsius, so I translated it for you. Um, you know, this is how long it took dogs to roll up into sternal versus if you keep them warm, boom, they're sitting up, they're good to go. So it delays recovery. And that's, you know, everybody knows that. So when they're cold, they have decreased metabolism. Your anesthetic requirements when you're cold are less. And if you just think about physics, if you're still really interested in physics, um, inhalant anesthetics are more soluble in cold blood than they are in warm blood. So you get a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more inhalant on board in the um, cold animals. The other thing that you will probably now all think about, you'll see it, an animal's coming out of surgery and it just doesn't want to start breathing on its own. That happens quite a lot, right? Well, if you're cold, there's reduced respiratory drive and there's delayed return of spontaneous ventilation. So you're often sitting there with the animal and you just keep on trying to disconnect it from the machine, but it won't breathe. It's probably because it's cold. And it's because it's cold and probably still um, got too much anesthetic on board. Post-operative shivering is um, something that we, we try and avoid as much as possible. When you're shivering, you know it's a fairly violent, a lot of energy. So you, it actually increases oxygen requirement or oxygen consumption by, you know, 200%. So you remember, you have your animal on 100% oxygen for the procedure, then you take it to recovery, it's shivering, and now it's on room air. That's 21% oxygen. So you can run into um, hypoxia, they become acidotic. The other thing is shivering is painful. Shivering itself, you know that when you're shivering violently, it hurts. But can you imagine shivering when you have an incision in your belly as well? So it, um, shivering can cause pain as well. Cardiac complications, when, animals, when, a heart get, when an animal gets cold and his heart gets cold, 
you get bradycardia, decreased cardiac output. And I can tell you, when animals get cold, you, everyone says, well, it's bradycardic. Let's give it atropine. Atropine doesn't work when they're cold. The only, the only solution to bradycardia caused by hypothermia is getting them warmed up again. And then if they get cold enough, the heart stops spontaneously. How do you think they get hearts to stop for cardiac bypass? They dump ice water um, on the heart and it stops. So bradycardia and um, decreased um, response to anticholinergics. The other thing is when animals are cold, um, they begin to release catecholamines, which makes the heart way more irritable. So that's another problem that we have. The other thing is, think about it. Blood is thicker when it's cold. Just, you know, it's a good pictorial. Think about maple syrup sitting out in Florida, you know, on a picnic table versus in the fridge. Glug, glug, or flowing nicely. Blood's the same. When it gets cold, it's like sludge. And so you have impaired perfusion and increased blood viscosity when they're cold. Blood loss. Animals that are cold, and this is from human data, but it can be documented in research animals. Um, in humans, with a core temperature decrease of only 3 Fahrenheit, 1.6 Celsius, blood loss is increased by 30%. So when an animal gets cold, it bleeds more. So that in itself is a complication. I'm going to tell you why. So, so when animals are, or when blood gets cold, there's impaired platelet function. Now, there's no change in the number of platelets, but there's reduced release of thromboxane, which is what, you know, contributes to the whole clotting mechanism. Clotting factor enzymes don't work outside a very narrow mammalian body temperature. And of course, you know, we get animals back to surgery. They've been down to CT, they've been here, they've been there. We get them in the surgery room and the surgeon says to me, this animal is bleeding. It's like really bleeding. And I'm like, because it's cold. They say, no, there's got to be something wrong with the animal. So, of course, you say, fine, I'll take... So, you take a blood sample, and you run downstairs, and you run a PT and PTT, and they're all normal. Because what temperature do you run those tests at? Normal at 37 Celsius. But the animal's bleeding because it's cold. The other thing is fibrillinic activity is altered um, by hypothermia, and you get impaired clot formation. So, blood just doesn't act like blood when it's cold. doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Another thing about getting cold is it increased the risk of post-op wound infection. The two things that lead to wound infections is long surgeries and hypothermia. And that's well documented in the human literature. And one study from Pennsylvania documented that in dogs. Why is that? Well, what happens is eventually, you know, a lot of these dogs end up vasoconstricted or vasoconstricted during recovery. You have a decrease in blood flow and oxygen delivery to the uh, wound site. Um, people say, well, if we give antibiotics, everything will be fine. Well, if you have vasoconstriction and poor you know, wound, uh, blood flow to the wound, and you have that viscous thick blood and not an, an impaired perfusion, then your antibiotics are not getting delivered to the wound. And it allows bacterial fixation. And also, um, hypothermia impairs immune cells and immune, normal immune function. So, we get in the picture, there's nothing good about being cold. So ambient temperature, yeah, here's the, what you were asking. So the ideal for the patient is 26 to 28 Celsius, so 79 to 80, 83 Fahrenheit. Here's, I took, uh, I took this into our hospital and went around the room. Our prep area is at 70, I think it's too cold, we should have it warmer. Um, but our ORs, that's how cold our ORs are. So obviously not ideal for the patient, but it is nice not to have the surgeons falling over. So what can we do about that? We have to do something about keeping them warm. So cutaneous warming, we can, you know, passively, we can put blankets on our animals, and certainly that reduces heat losses by up to 30% by trapping a layer of air, and we can start that, you know, right after we pre-med them. But we can do things active. Water blank, circulating hot water blankets, the warm forced air, and then we have this new, some of you may have seen the new hot dog um, blankets. Um, certainly these are things that we can think of. But I think pre-warming is important because heat loss starts the minute you pre-med your animal. You alter their hypothalamic function, you might be vasodilating them. So what we do now is when animals have been sedated, but they're waiting to be have their catheters put in so on, they either get a blanket put on, we have a nurse that makes all these little blankets for us, or we stick them in a cage, either with a, a warm blanket underneath 
or with a bear hugger around them while they're waiting because you can pre-warm or at least prevent that initial drop. Simple things, warm up the prep solution. Even for doing IV catheters, I warm up the prep solution or just don't use alcohol anymore. Just use saline um, in, in warm prep solutions. Blankets during the prep time, you know, you can have your blanket on. You know, if you're prepping something that's not under here, um, we're waiting, you know, put on a, a blanket. Um, we often will have our dog sitting up. This is the new hot dogs that we're you know, looking at. Um, it's a nice technology. They're sitting there, you know, waiting for their catheter, but they're still being kept warm. And they were in here being kept nice and warm while they're waiting. But you can use simple stuff. Um, I love bubble packing. If you can make sure people don't pop it. But I save every piece of bubble wrapping I ever see, and I take it down to all the different places in the hospital and say, put this around it if you don't have, you know, something else. Um, bubble packing is very, very insulating. It's simple and cheap. Other things, you know, newspaper on a metal table is a good insulator. It really is. Other things I, I've made um, is take, you know, these um, chips, these polystyrene chips that come in everything. I put them into paper, into plastic bags, and then seal them. And you can sit a little kitten or a dog on there. They feel warm. If you put your hand on a polystyrene cup or a polystyrene lid, it feels warm. And so I save all of these. I go around the hallways at the hospital picking up all the, the packing chips and these um, and using them to try and keep my animals um, warm. These, this you can wash. These, if you, do, if you seal this bag, you can wash those and use them the next day. Again, these things that you see a lot, those things, it holds a kitten perfectly. If you take two of those, a kitten fits in that perfectly. Here's a kitten on bubble packing if you don't have the luxury of heating blankets for everything. Now, here's something I would have you stop doing. The warmies. I am going to like try and, and I keep throwing them away and they keep coming back. I throw, these are not a good idea. We know that they, they only, they're very ineffective and we have good data to support that. They cover a small surface area. They're actually dangerous. You can cause thermal injury um, and the local tissue reaches the temperature of the water. So if you stuff them around an animal and then the bags get cold, then it's the opposite. The animal, you know, it sucks heat out of the animal. I would like you not to be using these warmy bags. Circulating water blankets are very, very good. Um, there's data out there showing that if we use these blankets and they looked at a single blanket over the animal, a, a, a sandwich of blankets over and under, or actually using these blankets wrapped around their feet and legs, um, they show that they're very good. But what we learned from that study is if you keep the legs and feet warm, that's a very good thing to focus on. So then you can start thinking about getting some, you know, a pack of 20 tube socks from Walmart, it's pretty cheap, and stick them on dogs' and kittens' legs, or wrap up you know, with tube gauze, keep their legs and feet warm is certainly helpful. Forced warm air, we have data, is definitely, you know, I've been doing anesthesia for 30 years, and I would say that the forced warm air technology is probably the best anesthetic invention I've seen in 30 years. It's made a huge difference in my ability to keep animals warm and have a better recovery. So certainly in cats that weighed under four and a half kilos, 90 minute of anesthesia, they had either just passive um, versus the um, bear hugger type technology, and there was a big difference in body temperature after um, surgery. And one degree Celsius or 1.8 Fahrenheit is a big difference. So very, very beneficial. And we use these certainly in recovery. Um, you know, we don't have one for every animal. This is kind of our communal recovery area over in shelter. Here we are, they're all sharing the, the blanket that we, we have for them. But definitely, it just feel if you go under there with them, it feels really good. And then this is something that you might be seeing that the, the um, engineer that designed or developed the bear hugger has now started this company and is using this um, special technology. Um, everyone thinks this hot dog must be for the veterinary market. This is actually human. Um, product, but they do have veterinary blankets, and it's a, we don't know what's in it, it's a secret radiant fabric, but it doesn't burn animals, and it's very, very effective, and we are, like I say, we are using the hot dog um, out in the prep room, and again, in the surgery room as well. Radiant heaters, again, be, you have to be extremely careful, and I would prefer you not to use these, so we used to use them, this is a really old picture, um, from University of Florida, we used to have these um, heat lamps while we were getting animals prepped for surgery. If you get them too close, you can cause all sorts of problems and, and burns 
as that's what can happen. So that was a dog that had a beautiful factual repair, but was you know either an electric blanket, which you can get um, you know can cause burns like that, or um, infrared um, lamps. Because if they're laying on an electric blanket or you know skin pressure is an issue, I mean electric blankets should not be anywhere near an anesthetized animal. But these infrared lamps, um, you know, if the animal's vasoconstricted or you know it's all being clipped up and shaved, you can burn them. The other thing you should realize is if you use iodine prep solution, it actually absorbs heat. Um, you know, so you've got to be very careful. And I would, I we just don't use them anymore. So in summary, I think if you only focus on one thing when you go back to your clinic, and it's hypothermia, you can make your animals more comfortable. I think there's no doubt it, hypothermia contributes to mortality in our very small patients. So it's very common. There's nothing good about it. Um, cooling begins at pre-medication, so think about things you can do. You know, blankets, jacket, whatever. Um, getting them up off the metal cages. Keep your anesthesia in surgery times to a minimum. We know that's good for mortality. They're less likely to get as cold. And then the warm air systems and the hot dogs are very, very effective, but there are other very simple things, you know, the packing chips and all those things that you can do that will help. So we know how to keep them comfortable, and now we know how to keep them alive. So hopefully there's some tips there that you can take home. <laughs>